Now let's consider part two of chapter one, book five, and this is on the expense of justice. Again, the title of the overall chapter is Of the Expenses of the Sovereign or Commonwealth, and the title of part two is Of the Expense of Justice. Smith stresses right away that protection from injustice is the second duty of the sovereign, the first, of course, having been national defense. There's a quite lengthy and interesting philosophical discussion of the main causes of inequality, and finally Smith settles on birth and fortune as the main reasons why some individuals are doing much better in life than others. In some regards, this discussion harkens back to Smith's earlier theory of moral sentiments. You may be wondering, why are there sheep in this picture? Well, Smith stresses that inequality really becomes significant in a society of shepherds. Here, Smith's analysis takes an almost Marxian turn, and he discusses how much societies of shepherds have property and thus accumulation of wealth and differing degrees of accumulation and inequality, and finally relationships of subordination where some individuals stand considerably over others. You will note these are also themes in the more general writings of the Scottish Enlightenment, including Adam Ferguson and also the philosopher John Millar. Smith then moves to the critical question of whether the judicial system should be thought of as a revenue source or whether it is more properly considered to be an expense of government. Note at the time that court systems generally were means of raising revenue. That is, if you wanted to bring a lawsuit, in some manner you had to pay. Not just to pay the lawyer working for you, if you even had one, but rather pay the court system itself. Smith is very skeptical of the idea of a justice system as a source in revenue. He makes the obvious point that it favors the wealthy, because the wealthy have a much greater ability to pay, and in Smith's view, this furthers the subordination of one group of individuals to another. Smith makes yet another critique of the use of a justice system for revenue, and that is, when courts receive money from lawsuits, very often the courts will seek out too many suits because they want to acquire more revenue, so they will take on all comers, anyone with any kind of claim of litigation, simply to maximize their revenue, and Smith thought this was an essentially harmful incentive. Smith then goes on to defend a separation of powers, and he wants to pull apart the executive function of government from the judiciary, an idea, of course, which was to find fruition in the United States. Smith has at least two reasons for wanting to do this. The first is division of labor, namely that the judiciary is so important that it requires a kind of protected specialization, but also Smith wanted to keep everyday politics out of the justice system because he saw this as basically corrupting. Overall, in this section, Smith is preferring the rule of law to the rule of persons. He's expressing concerns about how the rule of law can be corrupted by monetary incentives, and he's pro providing a very basic and indeed profound theory as to the sources of inequality and as to how a law system can mirror those inequalities and in some cases make them worse. Overall, I find this to be a fascinating and original chapter. If you'd like just a bit more information on 18th century British courts, there's one very good short piece online by David Friedman. It's called Making Sense of English Law Enforcement in the 18th Century, and it will give you just a bit of institutional background for understanding this segment of Smith.